Most of us probably know our keynote speaker's scientific and professional CV. Uh, but I suspect that anyone who has had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Robert Ziegler, especially if Bob has had a few cups of coffee on that day, comes away from the experience of chatting with him with an inkling that his brain is frightfully large. Bob Ziegler's thoughts, grounded in deep expertise and more than three decades of research experience in the developing world, span not only agriculture science and food security, but humanity and the cosmos. This might also say something about his heart. Bob is passionate about the mission. As Director General of the International Rice Research Institute, it is evident that, to him, rice science for a better world means food, nutrition, and income security for the far fringes, most vulnerable, and least served. It is fortunate that he has devoted his intellect and his passion to our shared cause. We are fortunate that he is our keynote speaker today. Ladies and gentlemen, please kindly join me in welcoming Dr. Robert S. Siegler. And today we'll be talking about the second green revolution has begun, rice research and global food security. Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. Your Excellency, uh, Privy Councilor to the Royal Family, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, friends, it's a real pleasure to uh, be able to speak with you this afternoon. I'm a little bit taken aback by Tony's uh, remarks there, I have to say. Uh, I am going to talk uh, about the second green revolution that has, I believe, already begun. I'm sure you'll be convinced after I'm finished that what I'm saying is, is correct. I'm going to dive a bit into the science and a bit of the philosophy behind uh, where we've come from and where we are, are going. Uh, I would like to remind you that we are, or I am from the International Rice Research uh, Institute. We've been working to improve rice production, the welfare of rice farmers, the ensure the sustainability of the rice production systems since 1960, headquartered in the Philippines. Um, we, and I'm sure you will see as we uh, go through the conference that Erie does not do this work on its own. We work together in close partnerships with our, our, our friends and colleagues around the world. And I think it's a great example of applying science to development, to, to demonstrate that what has been dreamed can actually be realized. Uh, we are a member of a group of international research centers around the world that were actually built on the model of Erie to address a wide range of problems facing, uh, facing mankind and, and, uh, and food security. Most recently, we've come together to form a global rice science partnership that you'll hear about throughout the, uh, the, the rest of the, of the conference. We have joined with Africa Rice in, in, in Africa, a, a center focused on rice research, uh, SIAT in South America, IRD and CIRAD from Japan, and Jerkus in, uh, in France, and Jerkus in Japan uh, to form a global rice science partnership that puts together an agenda that addresses a broad range of research topics uh, worldwide. We have more than 900 partners in GRISP, and I think it's, it is a phenomenal achievement to bring together the entire global rice research community. Now, Despite the, the fantastic demonstrations and cultural uh, presentations that we've seen here on the stage, I think it's worth a few moments to reflect on what is rice. Where does it sit in the world today? First of all, it is perhaps the oldest domesticated crop at least 10,000 years ago, and, and it is tremendously diverse. It is perhaps the most diverse of all our domesticated crops, not the least of which because domestication may actually continue to be going on in the fields of, of Asia and Africa and Latin America today. But as I'm sure you've begun to appreciate, rice is far more than just a food. It actually penetrates 
the societies and cultures of rice growing countries, particularly in Asia. Uh, there was an article that came out of the Science Magazine in May that uh, did a quantitative assessment of how rice cultures are fundamentally different from those cultures that are built on other crops. But it's more than just a, it's not just a cultural icon uh, for the world. Uh, it is also the staple food for well over half the world's population. So if you consider that it's a staple food, it's a cultural, a central cultural precept in, in, in many societies, if there's a rice shortage, it's far more than just, I'll go have potatoes or bread instead. It's an existential crisis. And finally, keep in mind that rice flourishes in the monsoon of environment across Asia, where most of our major crops around the world would die under this kind of condition, rice flourishes. And rice will continue to flourish for, for generations to come. Now, where is rice consumed? If we have a look here, these are uh, the darker colors on the map represent the, the greatest per capita consumption. Very large amounts of rice eaten in Asia. But if you look across the globe, you can see Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, all show significant rice consumption. What's particularly striking is if you overlay the distribution of poverty, of extreme poverty, over rice-consuming uh, rice areas. Each dot represents a quarter of a million people living in destitution. So to me, it's clear that if we want to do anything about poverty in this world, rice will have to be a part of the, a part of the equation. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the second Green Revolution, but it bears thinking about the first Green Revolution. If we think back to the 1950s and 1960s, yields were very low, a mere ton and a half per hectare across the world. Uh, if you added fertilizer, the crop just grew tall and fell over and yields didn't go up. And widespread famines were predicted. Asia was considered to be a basket case. But with the investment in agricultural research, and rice research in particular, a few visionaries in the Rockefeller and Ford Foundation identified partners in Asia and said, we can create a different world. We transformed the rice plant, and they did that, going from the tall, lanky traditional varieties to the semi-dwarf varieties. That when you add fertilizer, they added more grain instead of just stems and leaves. Today, yields are well over four times per hectare, and economists agree that the foundation of the economic miracle of Asia was built on a supply of abundant, affordable rice. And I think this is an example of science doing what people said could never be done, and as scientists, we should take great pride in the accomplishments of that first Green Revolution. I call it Green Revolution 1.0. It was the creation of the semi-dwarf varieties. There were many more iterations of that first Green Revolution. Changes in pest and disease resistance, crop management practices, etc. But all formed part of that first Green Revolution. But as we heard earlier, the demand for rice is growing and continuing to grow. Um, by, uh, if we look at uh, up to 2040, we're going to need another 112 million metric tons of rice per year just to stay where we are. And if you think about the figures I cited earlier, where we are is not good enough. We have to continue to increase our, our rice supplies to meet our projected demands. But unfortunately, yield growth is dismally low. Below 1% per year which means that if we stay on today's trajectory, we will not be able to meet tomorrow's demands for rice. So it's imperative that we renew our investments and efforts to improve rice productivity. And it's not just demand that challenges, that challenges us. I think there's no question that climate change is already affecting our situation. Temperatures, rainfall patterns, Sea level rise are all realities that are before us, and of course, the threats of increased severity of tropical storms, all of which will hit rice producing areas especially hard. So we will have to meet tomorrow's demands facing a changing climate that is in many ways adverse for us. And where's the world's rice going to come from? 
come from? I think there's no question that the preferred answer is it will come from existing lands and we will increase the output from those lands. And that's mostly going to be in Asia. 20 years from now, we hope that Africa will enter into a major source of supply for the world. But over the next couple of decades, Asia is going to have to step up its productivity. But if we consider what's happening in Asia, we have land is moving out of rice, labor is moving out of rice, water is being diverted for other uses. So we're going to have to produce much more rice on the same amount of land or less land with less inputs and better use of labor. A major challenge uh, facing us. And those major challenges are just to stay where we are, and I'm telling you that is not good enough. And I want to remind you that if Asia is not sufficient in rice, the world itself is food insecure. So I think it's clear that to meet tomorrow's uh, demands and address the challenges of food insecurity, poverty, a second green revolution is needed, and I maintain it is a green revolution that will have to be firmly rooted in science. And when I talk about a second green revolution that is science-based, what do I mean by that? We are in the midst of a tremendous revolution in science, genetics, molecular biology, plant physiology, all of which completely open the doors for many new innovations, allowing us to tackle problems that we did not think we could address before. We also can link what is happening in the soils, in the rice paddy, in the waters, to better understand and manipulate how our rice plant is nourished and do so in a sustainable way that does not contaminate groundwaters or surface waters, rivers and streams and lakes. We have an unprecedented growth in computational capacity, communications capacity, the ability to amass and analyze and manipulate enormous data sets, the kinds of data sets that are created by the earlier two revolutions. And through our communications, we can have teams distributed around the world working together in real time. We can address questions at a level of complexity that were previously undreamed of. And I think most importantly, the scientific community is recognizing that unless we engage our policymakers, our decision makers, and yes, our politicians, we are not going to be able to have the fruits of our revolutions move to the, to, the, to the rice fields and, and benefit rice farmers and consumers. So let's talk a little bit about the science. Well, the first thing we cannot overestimate, in my opinion, is the con potential contribution of genetic resources. At Erie, we hold 120,000 accessions of rice varieties. Imagine that diversity developed over thousands of years of rice farming. But a very tiny amount has been used in our breeding program. But as was mentioned earlier this afternoon, we have just completed the sequencing of 3,000 members of that collection. We sequenced 3,000 rice genomes. When I became Director General of Erie, it was a front page story that we had sequenced one genome. Today, we've, we've sequenced 3,000 in a period of months, and it's a routine occurrence. And from that, genetic platform, we have with our partners designed a flow to systematically identify the, the, the useful traits in, that genetic, in, that gene, in those genetic resources and translate them into useful varieties, addressing pests, diseases, biotic and abiotic stresses. This opening up of the, of the rice gene bank will in fact enable the second green revolution to take place. When we look at the 3,000 lines that are sequenced, for that to be useful, we have to understand how the plant performs. How does it perform, and how does that performance relate to the genetic sequence? And so we are, we are we're looking at the, the development of a systematic approach to generate a real return on those 3,000 genomes. It is the broadest collection of information of any organ, any crop in the world, far and away. And I want to emphasize that we are 
under pressure to create new technologies. But money can't buy us time. But what money can do is put time on our side. And by, uh, by the sequencing of these genomes, we can make a tremendous investment in making, taking the science and taking the science forward. Now, to identify the genotypes, the genes, the alleles, what have you, improve our breeding programs, we have to relate performance to sequence. And we have, with our partners around the world, a tremendous number of facilities that are being brought together to systematically evaluate the sequences of our life successions. We have facilities, we have field environments, we have um, mobile field sensors, drones, all of which are being used to collect the, the data that will allow us to use the genetic information effectively and, and powerfully. And one of the challenges we have is to make rice climate ready. We know that the climate change is, is confronting our rice production systems. How can we deal with it effectively? If we look at where most of the rice is grown, in the world, it's in the river deltas of Asia. 50% of the growth in rice production in the last uh, 25 years came from the river delta areas. River deltas are by definition at sea level. So you can certainly expect greater problems with flooding and seawater intrusion to the rice production areas in the future. And large areas of rice in Asia are prone to flooding. Uh, about 10 million hectares at least are lost to flooding every year. And even favorable areas suffer short-term flooding. And our scientists over the years have identified sources of resistance in our gene bank to flooding, to prolonged exposure to flooding. Uh, it took a while to move those materials into useful backgrounds. As a matter of fact, the grain quality and agronomic performance of the flood tolerant rices that were early developed were very poor. As a matter of fact, a friend from Thailand told me once that the first flood tolerant rices were so bad that his dog wouldn't eat it. Now, if you're a plant breeder and someone tells you your rice is so bad, your dog wouldn't eat it, that's like a dagger to the heart. Uh, but they, they kept at it and uh, were able to identify the gene from flood tolerance, move it into varieties that have good grain quality and high yield, and this is how they looked in the field. Those uh, plots with the white, Names in white don't have the flood tolerance gene. Those with the names in yellow have the flood tolerance gene. And it's quite clear that the ones with the flood tolerance gene in yellow perform much better than the white ones. This was after 17 full days of complete submergence in that plot. And by any stretch of the imagination, that is a catastrophic flood event. It's also reminds me why I don't, didn't study too much statistics. You won't have to be a statistician to to see the difference there. Well, that was our the performance in Erie's field plots. In 2008, this was taken out to eastern India and evaluated under real-world flood conditions in a farmer's field. This is Mr. Ashraman Paul, who was one of our first collaborators. And this is what his field looked like, planted to flood tolerant variety after two successive floods. His neighbors were laughing, saying, ah, plow up. You're not going to get anything out of that. And we talked him into to say, no, 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 take a look at it, just let it sit for a while. And that's what that same field looked like on October 31st. Miraculous recovery is how it was described by the farmers there. And that material was moving across India, South Bangladesh, and Southeast Asia very quickly. Millions of farmers have already received seed of the material. Um, and I go out on a limb. I talk about the second green revolution. And I say not only has the second green revolution begun, I can tell you that the second green revolution began at 1.17 in the afternoon, July 31st, 2008, when Mr. Paul did not plow up his field. But he showed the faith in the science that we could overcome a problem that had plagued him and his ancestors for generations untold. And when we look at the impact of this technology, we had uh, some of the world's top agricultural economists come out and look at the performance of these materials in the field, do assessments of what, how they were being adopted and by whom. They published a paper in one of the Nature Family of Journals, top, top journals in the world, 
The title says flood tolerant rice reduces yield variability and raises expected yield, differentially benefiting disadvantaged groups. When I read the last paragraph of that paper, I literally got goosebumps. My hair stood on end. And that last paragraph said in part that this study indicates that scheduled castes are likely to be a major beneficiary from the spread of Swarna sub-1 in India, the flood tolerant varieties. The scheduled castes are the lowest of the low, the untouchables. So this technology, this group of the most exquisite research from some of the finest laboratories in the world is differentially benefiting the poorest of the poor. Now, if that isn't a scientific revolution, I don't know what is. And it gives me great pride to be a scientist and to have been associated with the people who've done that work. And it's not just the science. It's also getting seed out. We started with 10 kilograms of seed in 2006 going to India. We have hundreds of tons, or thousands of tons, of seed now produced. The Indian government fully on board, state governments on board, research organizations, NGOs, and the private sector. So if you're going to move a technology, you can't just perform well, people have to buy in. Governments, private sector, NGOs, and communities. But it can be done. And it's not just a story of the past, it's a story of today. This is so impressed the governments of India, Bangladesh, and Nepal that last Sunday, week from yesterday, the day before, I went to Nepal, I sat down with the Secretary of Agriculture of India, Secretary of Agriculture of Bangladesh, the Secretary of Agriculture of Nepal, and signed an agreement that each country would recognize the varietal release processes of the other. They put national pride aside and said, if we can get the best technology out, and you, our neighbors, have judged it worthy, we will accept it and move it as well. A tremendous breakthrough, politically and, and socially. Thinking about drought. Drought is a problem, not just floods. And we are developing along the same lines drought tolerant materials that will give us an additional ton of rice per hectare, even in severe drought years. And interestingly enough, and surprisingly enough, we are combining, combining drought tolerance and flood, flood tolerance within the same variety. Because farmers in these environments get hit by a drought or a flood in the same year. So they need tolerance to both. It would seem impossible to do that, but we've done it. And I say we because I like to take credit for other people's work. But our scientists around the world working together have done this. And it's not just stresses from the environment that can impose hardship on our rice consumers and farmers. Micronutrient deficiencies are the scourge around the world. Zinc, vitamin A, iron are ter cause terrible losses. And rice is deficient in those. Rice feeding populations tend to be deficient in these. So we're developing varieties that carry these micronutrients, the most famous of which is golden rice that carries beta carotene. This can this can deliver dietarily significant amounts of vitamin A to vitamin A deficient, deficient populations. We expect that to be coming out in a few years. It's a long road, but we, we're, we're nearly there. Now, just to close on the breeding aspect or area of things, the breeding program by itself doesn't get very far. In today's world, breeding programs around the world must work together. And I selected this just to illustrate that in Africa, materials are taken from all over the world and brought, to, brought together and distributed out amongst national programs so that they can assess not just from within Africa, but from all over what is useful to them. Part of that Global Rice Science Partnership. And they have partnerships all around Africa for the distribution of materials. And if we look at breeding programs now, again, we're not independent breeding program, but we have materials flowing around the world from all breeding centers. And what we have now is a continuous cloud of exchange of germ plasma that tells me that for the foreseeable future, we'll be creating materials that surpass the dreams of the first people who started the Green Revolution. But what do we do about managing our crop? 
It's not all about varieties. You've seen that. If you have a great variety that's poorly managed, you will never express that potential. So let's just think for a moment about what we need. We know the fields, rice fields vary. The different farmers face different constraints, different financial uh, opportunities and limitations. But each farmer needs information that's relevant to his or her field. How can they get that information? Well, we have been working with partners around Asia for over 20 years, collecting detailed crop performance data, fertilizer response, etc., and have developed very solid scientific underpinnings that will allow us to recommend what a particular farmer should apply in his or her field in a given year, growing a particular variety. And they need that if they want to make informed decisions. And we have placed that, those decision-making tools on some very sophisticated platforms that are accessible by the most simple technologies. Farmers with the ordinary cell phone, 2G technology, can access sophisticated databases, bases driven by even more sophisticated crop models, and get information specifically about what fertilizer, what water regimes, what crop protection, what varieties to, to, to use in their fields. It's an amazing breakthrough. The technologies that were developed for entirely other purposes are now being made available to the poor rice farmers. Nobody thought when they were putting together cell phone technologies and, and, and crop models and, and tablets that they would be used by rice farmers to make intelligent decisions about how to manage their crop. But that's what's happening today. And this is being rolled out across Asia and into Sub-Saharan Africa. An amazing tool that will transform many, many different aspects of rice production. I hope extending to the availability of credit to farmers as well as crop insurance. And today, uh, just a few days ago, almost 200,000 farmers in the Philippines have started to use this technology on their own. It's, it's moving out, it's moving out at scale. We did a quick study to figure out how good this was for the farmers. 4,700 pesos gain for them, that's about 100 US dollars. For some, that may not seem like very much, but for others, it's an awful lot of money. And I was reminded of our work in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we're working with the poorest of the poor women in a country called Burundi, and to grow rice using new technology, similar to those I was talking about, and think about a hundred dollar a year gain. Well, these are people who said that before working with us, their families were eating only once a day. Now they eat twice a day. So a few hundred dollars extra for people like that is a tremendous amount. Now wrapping up, I think we need to look at our policymakers again, asking what we need to know to make informed decisions so that the fruits of science can benefit all of us. We need to understand how much rice is being grown, where it's being grown, what our supplies look like. What's a harvested area? When will be harvested? What yield can we expect? And we are using a combination of remote sensing, crop growth models, weather data, to give us those in from that information in real time at regional scale. Not a field, not a district, not a county, not a township, but across areas like the Mekong Delta. We're leveraging new technologies. <laughs> Remote sensing, satellite imagery, GIS uh, systems, etc. Working with private sector, public sector, using publicly launched satellites that are today providing us free imagery. So we're mapping rice.